Hello, everyone. Welcome to Angular Insights. We were on summer break and now we're back. We're very excited for, for you to be joining us. We have a very special session today with David Peterson from Airtable, who's going to be talking about strategies for bottoms up B2B growth and no code tools. Um, we are doing these sessions to be to bring our community together. So we really encourage um, you know, these sessions to be interactive. So we encourage you to ask a lot of questions. If you have any questions, simply click the raise hand button and then the second half of the session, we will take your questions. We, we love having questions over audio. So we actually unmute your mic. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Gil. Hey, Anne, how are you? Great, great, you know. Move that, you have a new background. That's, that's not a fake background apparently, right? <laughs> Not a fake background. I finally got out of Jersey City and I'm in Connecticut for the next nine months. So very excited cool. about that. I'm surrounded by nature. And I've got the same white wall behind me, which is not, <laughs> not, not fake either. Um, uh, I'm, I'm waiting until the pandemic is thoroughly defeated before I go on any kind of vacation. Uh, David, thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, we really, really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, um, no, ha happy to be here. And we've, we've had a number of conversations over the past few, uh, few, few months, and it's, it's, it's a thrill to be able to sort of share those more broadly. Um, uh, let me maybe just start by introducing you uh, just for the audience. So David uh, is, is an American. I think I actually never confirmed that. Are you actually an American? I, yeah, I am an American. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, you're not a Canadian or some other thing like that. I, guess <laughs> no. yeah. I get into all kinds of trouble with that. Um, but uh, so David's an American based in London, um, employee number sounds like, like 15, 16 at Airtable. Something like um, that, yeah. Runs, runs their global partnerships um, out of London. Uh, prior to Airtable, actually worked at a VC called Founders Collective, which is a New York-based VC, uh, which we've got a ton of respect for. I have an old historical uh, co-investment with them that, that didn't work out all that well, um, but an amazing fund. Um, and actually worked as a founder, bootstrapped the company before I went into venture. So I think can speak from, from the perspective of both an operator and a VC and an early stage founder. Um, I should also say that, you know, while, while David sort of generously agreed not to plug Airtable, I should say that we as a fund um, really built our entire operational back end on Airtable. Um, so we do all of our deal flow on Airtable, all of our platform management on Airtable. I track uh, a big part of the LP relationships on Airtable, though I have a CRM set, uh, tool, tool for that as well. Um, so even this, even the set of forum, you know, conversations that we have, we track on Airtable, uh, just before we started, we were showing David how we use it to track that. So, so it's really become the backend and I've been, I've been sort of, uh, you know, a little pu publicly vocal about how I pine for Airtable to add features, but that's just a, 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 a function of how dependent we are on it and how, how empowering it's been. So. Thank you and the rest of the Airtable team for an, allowing us to build these kind of tools. I don't think we could have done it otherwise. Yeah. Um, we love the feedback too. Keep it, keep it coming. <laughs> don't worry. Um, so what I, I thought we'd, we'd, we'd start, like we typically start with a, with a bit of a presentation and then we bring in the audience as much as we can to ask as many questions as they want. Um, I know you've got a hard stop in an hour, so let's just get started and please take us through your talk and then uh, we'll invite the audience in to ask questions later on. Awesome. Uh, Cool. Uh, very excited. Thanks for having me uh, both. Um, so the uh, let's let's click here. Yeah. Um, oh, that's that's me. Um, so the the topic for the conversation today was uh, strategies for bottoms up B two B growth. And um, you know, I want to I'm going to include some no code stuff in this too because one, you know, Airtable itself is kind of has fallen into this new nascent uh, no code category. And also we used a lot of these no code tools uh, to drive a lot of these, a lot of these strategies back in the day. So this will both be some kind of lessons learned about the first, you know, my first few years at Airtable uh, and also some of the systems that we built to, uh, to kind of enable uh, some of these approaches. Um, so here's some, you know, when Gil and Ann uh, asked me to join here, they asked, Ask me to think about like what was the bottoms up growth uh, approach for Airtable back in the day, and, and you know, do we have any lessons learned from that experience? Uh, one thing that I'll, I'll caveat all of this with is, you know, I think it's so easy to overlearn the lessons of your own experience and essentially, you know, create uh, create frameworks that are that are so specific that they're only relevant to your company. You know, and nobody else could uh, could really learn. Um, um, 
you know, nobody else could really learn like what uh, from that experience, right? Like they're, it's just too, too specific. So in, in that regard, and I take this all with a grain of salt, you know, this is, this is kind of what we learned, but I think like, let's, especially when we have questions in the second half and we're talking a lot, um, yeah, you know, like let's talk about the nuance and how these things might be relevant for your company, might not be relevant. You know, this should just be one input in, in how you're thinking about things. Uh, but here's, here are my like top five thoughts on bottoms up B2B growth. Um, and I have like a specific, uh, kind of a few talking points for each of these. So I'll kind of run through them and then we can go through them one by one. Um, I think the first is, you, you know, you really have growth in mind uh, from the beginning. So it's hard to kind of tack on a bottoms up growth strategy. To that. And um, I joined Airtable, you know, after the product, after V1 of the product was already built. So a lot of this, a lot of these lessons learned and insights, you know, were learned by the team you know, the small team that, that built the product uh, before me, but I'll try to share what I am working with them. Uh, then second, we kind of, uh, what we did at Airtable at least is, you know, these are, in particular, these lessons are really relevant for a company that's horizontal, like the product is horizontal, like Airtable. And we really focused on finding use cases for the horizontal product and then developing go-to-market strategies for specific use cases. You know, so we, that enabled us as a horizontal product to then go to market in a lot of specific ways and build up, uh, build up momentum kind of across the board by going deep on different use cases. Uh, so I'll kind of walk through how we thought about that. Again, I think that's probably most relevant if you're a horizontal product, but there's, I think there's elements of it uh, that you can, you can bring to a vertical product company as well. Uh, and then something we're doing more recently, which I want to just touch on, is how do you thoughtfully combine this product-led growth with high-touch uh, human intervention and sales? And that's something that we're thinking about a lot now. Um, and again, I'll share some lessons learned from other folks on the team that are, are, that are really, really focused on this. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. Um, let's see. So uh, let me move this. Okay, so, so first things first, you know, um, I, I do think that you really need to build the product with bottoms up growth in mind if bottoms up growth is, is your growth strategy. Um, and I think, uh, you know, th there's a few reasons for that. Or, uh, and it, and, I, and I, would, I would separate it out by whether your product is horizontal or vertical. So if your product is horizontal, like, like Airtable, um, I really think uh, you should optimize for self-serve um, as you build a product. And there's a few reasons for this. The main one though is you don't necessarily know the best use cases for your product um, if it's horizontal. You know, you're not sure what the killer use cases are gonna be, what those killer segments are gonna be. So self-serve, like let the self-serve users find them for you. Like they, they are going to, uh, they're going to innovate more than you ever could. So get them into the product, let them start building, they'll find amazing use cases for you. And then you can leverage those and turn those into big growth strategies. Uh, so that's one big reason that I think, you know, self-serve is so critical for horizontal products. Uh, something that the, the product engineering team at Airtable did incredibly well was think about how to make the product valuable for individuals, um, but ultimately, uh, collaborative, ultimately team oriented. Uh, and, and that really kind of drives this natural expansion where the individuals love, fall in love with the product, become evangelists, much like our friend Gil here. Um, total air table, total air table, you know, uh, evangelists. But because the, the use of the product is so fundamentally collaborative, that's where it really, that's what really sings. There's kind of this natural drive towards expansion. And then when thinking about pricing, look, you can price a product like so many different ways. There's so many different, uh, so many different approaches. And so I think something we've learned is that pricing is going to be, pricing is an ongoing experiment. You know, like our pricing today is not the pricing that we'll have, you know, years from now. Um, and you, we'll probably be experimenting with it for the rest of the company's, of the company's life. Uh, the thing that we really want to think about with pricing is, um, you know, can you, can you orient the pricing such that you kick off that viral adoption expansion process? So that might be, um, you know, freemium. That might be a long enough trial, as I state here, 
so that you know uh, users have time to activate whatever that looks like for your product or maybe it's you know free for up to five users or free for up to 10 users right there's so many different angles but i think what what you're really trying to capture is lowering the barrier to users kicking off that process um, so my experience is definitely more so on the left i think if your product is a vertical you can kind of go either way and I, I threw a few like motivating questions in there, um, thinking about how your users like to buy software, uh, whether or not um, your users need a lot of help to be successful, or if you know self-serve is even possible. Like those are some things to think about um, uh, as you're as as you're deciding like how to design the product and whether bottoms up growth is is kind of the right approach uh, for your particular product as well. Um, okay, so next thing is, uh, you know, now you have some users coming in, um, you know, and, and this is really, again, kind of talk, speaking to our, the experience we, we had at Airtable, you know, the thing that we really thought about was how do you identify use cases that could be good vectors for growth, you know, could be good, uh, could, could be, yeah, could be good angles that you could then build a lot of momentum off of. And the way we really thought about this was, I mean, we basically built a team, and this is my team uh, two and a half or three and a half years ago now, uh, a team of folks who had varied experience, um, you know, varied like go-to-market experience. There were people who were consultants, you know, people who were product marketers, people who were like operations people, but they were all kind of entrepreneurial. And we thought of ourselves essentially as like user anthropologists. And our goal was, to talk to as many users as possible and try to uncover use cases. Uh, and the, the ultimate goal, which we'll get to, was to like find these, uh, find, find these uh, diamond use cases in the rough that we could then go to market with. But the way we started that with, the, the way we started it was, we're just going to talk to as many users as possible and try to make them successful. And, that, and literally early on, we were willing to have as many conversations with a user as, as it would take to make them successful. You know, as many touch points as mattered, uh, we would get on the phone with them, we would build out Airtable basis for them, you know, do whatever we needed to do to make them successful, to try to understand the specifics of that particular user in their specific industry, their particular function. You know, can we understand who these people are uh, and understand if Airtable is a good solution for them or not? Um, and the, the goal really, as I kind of write out here, was to identify opportunities that were like coherent enough that we could build a go-to-market strategy around them. And there were a few kind of tests that we, that like, and deliverables that we had to decide if this use case was coherent enough. And like two, two example deliverables that I thought were really useful. One is we would, you know, after having a bunch of conversations with users with a particular use case, if we're starting to become convinced that this could be a really good use case for us and we wanted to build a go-to-market strategy for it, first thing we would do is do one of those classic Amazon working backwards press releases where it's like, let's, what is the press release that you would, you would write um, upon the launch of like this use case? You know, what would that look like? Uh, and does it feel compelling? Uh, and usually that, that just the process of trying to do that would nix uh, a lot of the a lot of the ideas that we had because it just you realize that you didn't actually understand it understand it well enough and then we would also think about writing uh, basically like we, we called it a product positioning doc it's almost like the I don't know like the go to market version of a product requirements document you know it's who are the users what are their motivations what problems were they trying to solve how might you acquire them? I mean, it was basically like a mini business plan for this new use case uh, that we would try to put together. And then um, if, if we all kind of were on board with it, then we would start experimenting. Um, but the, and I'll get into how we experimented with it as well. But I think that uh, one thing I wanted to share is, you know, this process of try, talking and onboarding so many users was, uh, was really time consuming, right? It took, we, we, I probably, like this team, we probably had hundreds, thousands of calls over the course of, over the course of a year, um, something like that. 
um, this is not a sales team, right? Like we were, we were much more, um, so we weren't on the phone all day, but we were, and we didn't, and it, and it wasn't a sales process, right? So we couldn't really use like a classic sales CRM. So we kind of built our own system to manage this whole process. And this is where some of like the no code uh, system design stuff comes into play. So I wanted to show a version of how you could build this and kind of how we did it. Um, so this isn't exactly how we did it, but I, th I thought it might, uh, it might get some juices flowing for you guys on, on how you could design something similar today. I think this is basically how I would do it today if, if, I, were, if I were trying to design this again. So we, we were tracking new users uh, in Intercom and we were enriching all of our users with Clearbit data as well. Um, so basically the way this system worked is uh, whenever a new user came in that was enriched and had you know, employee count of greater than 100, greater than 250, right? we kind of figured out some, some general metrics to, to zoom in on higher quality users. Um, whenever a new user joined who, who hit those metrics, uh, we set up a zap that would ping a Slack channel. Uh, and then in that Slack channel, we would see all of these new users, you know, whenever they, whenever they hit, um, whenever they, they, they uh, whenever they signed up, they would hit this channel. And we would basically spend the whole day uh, tracking this Slack channel. It was kind of always out in the background. We set, set up notifications so we could see it. And if we saw a user come in that we thought was interesting, that we thought was worth talking to, what we would do is uh, do an emoji reaction to that Slack message. So that's the little check checkbox there. So we just emoji react to that Slack message. That would kick off a zap that would tag that user in intercom. So they would add, get added to an email, uh, an already created email campaign in intercom, intercom, which would ask them if they were interested in a one-on-one -on -one onboarding session with the person who did that emoji reaction. And it would also add that person that person's information to an Airtable base where we were keeping track of every single user conversation we were having. So it was that Airtable base was kind of like a quasi CRM where we were tracking, uh, tracking all of this information. And then Intercom, we were using both to track all users and as our email uh, system. So this let us track you know, hundreds, thousands of conversations uh, in a really, really lightweight way. And then in that Airtable base, we were keeping track of like, what industry is this person from? What function? You know, all of this other metadata as we were trying to understand what are these, what are the, you know, what are, what are the atomic use cases here that really matter? Um, is this a good fit or not? You know, do we want to turn this into a go-to-market strategy or not? Um, so that's kind of high level how it worked. Hopefully that's giving you a better idea of what it looked like, what it looks like day to day. Um, then, you know, one other thing that we, we thought a lot about is, you know, how do we think about like the desirability of a use case? You know, like there are lots of uses for all of our products. Like you could use it for a ton of different things. That doesn't necessarily mean you want to, you want to build a whole go-to-market, you know, strategy and, and invest that time and those resources to go after it. Um, so we, we, we thought about desirability across four different um, categories, four different buckets. Um, this is just, these are just a few examples. There's probably, there's probably examples of these that, that are much more relevant for your, uh, for your companies. But we thought a lot about, um, you know, different user characteristics, um, company characteristics, kind of standard. Is this high growth? Are there lots of employees? Um, overall market characteristics, you know, like is the market itself growing? Um, and specific use case characteristics as well. Um, I think these are, these are pretty, pretty generic. We had a much, much longer list, but just giving you a sense of how we started to think about it. And we kind of judged every use case across these different, uh, across these different buckets to try to normalize, you know, our, each of our individual, like anthropological user research experience, normalize it a little bit so we could come up with essentially a score, you know, of like, do we think this use case is, is valuable or not, and, or, or not, and, and worth, worth going after. Um, okay, so, you know, let's, now we've, we've had like a hundred calls, we've identified a use case that we think is interesting, you know, we've written up some, some documentation that shows that we really understand who these people are, 
uh, the users are. We understand this workflow. We've, we've put it into this framework and we said like, yes, this makes sense. Like on the fundamentals, this is a good, it's a good fit for what we think makes sense, you know, for our product. And then, then what, what do you do next? Um, so this is where we thought, we thought a lot about this idea of like full stack go to market, you know, and the, the basic idea here is, I, I don't know if anybody's read this book, uh, Marketing High Technology, pretty old, uh, old tech, um, like business book. Um, but I, I actually think very interesting, worth a skim. Um, and I think one, one really interesting takeaway uh, from this book was, um, you know, D uh, William Davidow, he distinguished between devices. So in his case, microprocessors, he worked at Intel in the era of Andy Grove and, and, and all those folks. So he distinguish, distinguishes between devices and products. And he talks about how, look, a device is invented in a laboratory, like a microprocessor is in the laboratory. A product, on the other hand, is, quote, the to totality of what a customer buys. Um, this is something we thought a lot about. Like the, the software is just the device, you know, in using Davidow's language, the, the product is the service, the messaging, the distribution, right? The landing page, the, the onboarding flow, the, the, right, the service, the customer support experience, right? It's like, it's all of those things in one is the product that people are buying. So we thought a lot about, well, for this particular use case, you know, what is the ideal product experience that we want users to have uh, based, on, based on what we know about them, based on the competition that we face in this, this particular segment? You know, how should we think about what this full stack go-to-market looks like, you know, which includes the distribution strategy and the landing page all the way through and like the messaging on the landing page, you know, all the way through to the onboarding experience and, um, and uh, the, you know, the, like whether that's like the email onboarding or maybe, maybe it's a high touch onboarding experience or something else, you know, something else ent entirely. So we, what we ended up doing is thinking a, and is kind of chose a few use cases over time and experimented with those pretty deeply, trying to find the different levers that we could pull that would make this use case much, you know, much more successful. Uh, than this other one. And we had a few kind of early on that were, were, were winners for us and let us, um, let us experiment with a lot more and then really led us to where we are now where we're no longer focused on specific use cases. We're a little bit, you know, we're like one level up from that now. We can talk about how that evolution happened too, which, was, which has been kind of interesting. But it all kind of started because we found these use cases and kind of experimented with them, with them one by one. Um, and the last thing, uh, last of the five here that I wanted to share is this idea of like hybridizing the, the go-to-market, if, if hybridizing is, is a word. Um, the, you know, and this is something that other folks on the team, so I, I'm not, uh, I haven't been directly working on this, ha have been working on recently, which has been amazing to see um, and, and uh, lots of lessons learned already. Um, but the basic idea here is, you know, with a product-led growth company, how can you thoughtfully layer in high-touch interactions? Like, so thoughtfully layer in sales on top of that product-led uh, growth, you know, uh, engine that you've already built. Um, so two kind of motivating questions that we've been asking ourselves a lot and experimenting, we're kind of experimenting with both of these bullets is, you know, number one, can high touch intervention help users activate or unlock value faster uh, than, than what you were able to achieve with whatever products led growth, um, onboarding flows or whatever else you, you've, you've created, you know, maybe there are just some natural limits to activation rates. And if you just put some high touch intervention on it, you'll actually be able to far exceed anything you can do with product led growth. And if you're able to experiment, like if you're able to design a good experiment, you might be able to prove that it's worth it. You know, it's worth spending the extra money and time uh, that it that it costs to you know hire a team of of uh, sales folks or SDRs or support folks. Like depends on what the the particular intervention is to help users. You might be able to prove that it's actually um, 
you know, it's actually ROI positive for you. This is something, as a quick call out, this is something that my colleague uh, Katya, uh, Katya Nelson, um, led a team on. It was, in, was uh, experimenting with just this. Like, can we prove stat sig that this, uh, this is the case, that we can uh, help users activate, upgrade faster? Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of um, a interesting experimentation you can do there. And on the, on the flip side, you know, can you also use high touch uh, intervention to prevent a user from churning? Um, and depending on how large the, that, that user is or what the potential LTV of that user is, it might actually be worth, again, high touch intervention. And again, there's only so much product led, led growth can do. Um, I, w the one thing I'll say with this is I think that, um, I, th I think we've all, we've all seen what Superhuman has done with their high touch onboarding. And I think it's easy to almost overlearn the lesson of superhuman, right? And, and just assume that the best way to go to market is uh, gated, you know, like gate your product, um, do high touch onboarding, right? Limit the number of users that you even let in the front door, right? Like there's, there's a way to kind of overlearn those lessons um, because I think ultimately it, it so depends on your particular product, your pricing, you know, everything else. Um, so I would think of all of these things as experiments. You know, is there a way that you can experiment with it rather than uh, defaulting to um, to like superhumans uh, to superhumans approach? Um, yeah. So those are the uh, those are my those are my quick thoughts. Oh, I forgot. I added in these these uh, advertisements that I think are really cool. Uh, that I just wanted to share. So so we've been talking a lot about use case led and like feature-led go-to-market, right? Like, let's identify a use case and go to market with that use case. As like, in this case, for us, it's like Airtable is a investor management system, like what Gil has built, you know? And we're gonna go to market with Airtable as that um, and really focus on features and value props for that specific use case. One thing that I, I, I've thought is really interesting through this process for us is to go back and look at how um, Apple advertise the Macintosh back in the day. And you think about it, and I think this is particularly relevant if you're building a product that is kind of defined, it's horizontal and kind of defining a new category, right? Like doesn't easily fit into any existing category. Um, you, you naturally fall into doing something like, I think what we've talked about here, which is trying to find use cases uh, and going to market with those use cases because you need to hold on to something. You don't have a category to hold on to. Um, and I think it's really cool to see what Macintosh did, or Apple did with Macintosh because the personal computer was kind of that, right? Like people didn't know what to use a personal computer for. It, truly, you didn't know what to do with it. And it's, it's hard to imagine what that must have been like. But back in the day, you actually had to describe the Macintosh that describe the personal computer in terms of use case. Like what are the things that you could do? Um, and there's this really cool series of um, ads. This was like a 20 page spread in a magazine. Um, and this is discussed in this book, Relationship Marketing, which is a, another one that I would, I would recommend. Um, and what's really interesting, I think about this, this ad is how focused it is on use case and features, right? It's not telling this you know, it's not the 1984 ad, like, you know, telling this like grand vision of, of the per, of personal computing just yet. It is very specifically saying, here's a specific use case and here's exactly how you can do it um, with a personal computer. Um, and I also love how the use case here is so like aspirational, right? You're designing a cool sneaker on this personal computer. Like how many personal computer buyers were designing sneakers? Not that many, but they found a use, you know, they found a use case that was aspirational and interesting and kind of like got people excited about what a personal computer might, could do for them. Um, so I think this is just a really, um, I find this to be a really interesting, uh, interesting thought experiment to think about. It's like, how did Macintosh think about building their go-to-market strategy when nobody knew what a personal computer was or what it could do? Uh, and there might be some parallels for your products out there, uh, out there as well. So that's the, that's the end of those slides. And um, yeah, I'm excited to, to dig into any questions that people have had along the way. Thank you so much, David. That was super interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing your insights with us. So I'm curious, you joined Airtable in 2017. There were only 15 people. 
that worked there back then. Um, what were the early days like? And what would you say um, about Airtable today would have surprised you back then? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the, the early days were, it, when I look back, um, it's, it's interesting that, um, look, back, back then, I feel like now Air, people, people know about Airtable, uh, at least a little bit. The awareness is a little bit higher. Um, and, uh, and people have a little bit more of an of a understanding of what you could, can do with the product. Um, back then, you know, the awareness was, was, so, was so low that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, and look, this is still a problem for us, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out like how to even describe what Airtable is. You know, like what is the first three seconds of that conversation when somebody at, at, a, at dinner or a customer asks you like, wait, what does that comp what does your company do? You know, and how do you actually, how do you actually, what's the elevator pitch? It, it was really challenging in the, in the early days. And I think that's why we became so focused on, on use cases because you could pivot quickly to, well, here's a problem that we can solve. Uh, and, and that kind of changed the valence of the conversation, you know, and let us talk about the customer and their problems rather than just, you know, talking about our product. Um, and I think, look, the, the thing that's like amazing to see today is how many, how many people out there um, are kind of doing that work for us now. You know, like the, the Airtable has, we are so lucky that we have so many people who are, uh, who are building amazing things with Airtable every day and, and have truly, they're so empowered by it. They truly fall in love with it. And in many ways, they kind of do that job because they, they show off all of the things that you can build. Uh, build with Airtable, and that that makes it a lot easier. That makes it a lot easier for us because we can point to what other people, you know, have built. Um, while we're still trying to figure out the right language to describe exactly uh, what it is that we are. So I want to ask you. Um, actually, first of all, thank you. That was fascinating. I think what was super interesting, David, was you talking about sort of the limits of of engagement superhuman style on the one hand and the limits of sort of classic PLG on the other hand. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about as a spectrum and startups should find the right point on the spectrum as opposed to going to one extreme. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of templates um, yeah. and, and how you guys think about that and are templates, are templates real things? Are templates like that's the product? Are templates just an example? Are they just aspirational? Are they, are they a trick where like I start using a template, I'm like, ah, screw it, I'll just go build it myself. But now that I've seen how it works, they like, like what's the role of templates in these kind of tools, whether it's, whether it's Wix for websites or whether it's yeah. you guys for, for these kind of tools? It, it's, a, it, it's a great question. And look, I'll be honest, I don't think we 100% know, it, it, really. It, is that it, because I, I think ultimately templates serve different purposes for different people. So, you know, we'll we'll talk to users who, who never have looked at a template. They're basically like, why would I do that? You know, I want the way that I learn how to use, use a product is to just dive in and figure it out. And then there are other people who not only did they start with the template, they deleted all of the information in the template and slowly rebuilt it from the template itself. So like they're using, in many ways, they're using the template itself uh, and everything in between, right? Those two ends of the spectrum. So um, we've, we kind of see all of that. Uh, and I don't think we fully, we, you know, truthfully, we launched with templates without, you know, knowing for sure if, um, you know, if they were going to, like, exactly the impact they would have. And we didn't do some sort of A-B test to see what the impact of templates was on, on activation rates or upgrade rates or anything like that. Um, you know, we just, um, oh, thanks for stopping sharing my screen. Um, it, you know, I think, I think we, we, we saw templates as a good way for us to, um, a good way for us to show off use cases, you know, in a, in, in a, um, in a way that users could uh, touch and feel a little bit. Um, and, uh, and we just kind of, and we took a flyer on it. 
you know, we kind of hoped that it, hoped that it would work. But but ultimately, I don't think we we I don't I don't think that we actually know um, the exact value of templates because it ends up being so unique uh, unique to the individual. I'll I'll say what what I think personally. But this is not backed up by data. This is backed up by anecdote. You know, from like talking with users. So to be perfectly clear, is you know I think templates are best when they're aspirational and they kind of show people what you could do. And they're all but they're also simple. You know, so they're simple enough that when you um, they're simple enough that when you look at them, you kind of get some of the core features and get how you know you could use Airtable to do this. And so they're not so complex that you you can't discern you know what's actually happening, but they're also a little bit aspirational, right? They're not like some, the boring thing that you do. They're the aspirational thing you wish you could be spending more time on. Uh, that's that's my guess is like that's the sweet spot, but we haven't been able to find data to like truly point us w one way or the other. Does anyone use them? People do. So pe some people do, but I I think the. Yeah, yeah, some people do, but I think the most common, my, my guess is the most common flow, it's kind of hard for us to track this, but my guess is the most common flow is people like open up a template, look at it, they say, huh, and then they go back, right. open up their own base and start building something, you know, and then maybe they reference a template later, but yeah. Yeah, on, on, on the other end of the spectrum, we'll, we'll, we have some questions uh, building up in the audience and okay cool all, all of you guys who are asking us awesome questions in the chat like just click on raise your hand so you can bring in the conversation ideally um but w just a, uh, another question from my side on the on the horizontal end of the spectrum and yeah. we have some companies that you know they're defining new categories and they're like well it could be vertical we could also be this cool horizontal category defining tool that's obviously sort of most exciting to me as a vc and i think it's most exciting to founders there's a ton of risk in that horizontal value prop, both on the implementation side, where because you don't have the templates, you don't have the use cases figured out, so you don't know what implementation mm -hmm. means. There also seems to be a ton of potential disappointment risk. Oh, I didn't realize I couldn't do this with Airtable because this one specific thing that I need to do, I can't do. Yeah. It's, so how do you manage that? How do you manage the sort of the, the user who shows up at Airtable totally gets the vision. It's like, oh, this is great. I'm yeah. going to build this amazing thing. I know there's this one thing that I can't do to get my amazing thing built, and now I'm disappointed. How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it, I think that the the vision for the product, since before I like long before I joined, the vision of the product was, you know, how do we build this this really powerful foundation? but then build lots of primitives, lots of like little Lego, like little pieces, little Legos, little Lego bricks um, to extend the foundational product in a ton of different directions. Um, so we, in many ways, we're trying to like have our cake and eat it too. You know, we're gonna build the 80% product and then for the 20% that's specific to your use case, we wanna give you the tools so you can build it, build it yourself. And you know, early on, I think that that 20% was the API, you know, like, yeah, it's not built yet, but, you know, if you're, if you have technical resources, you can kind of hack something together, right? Because we have this, this API that is auto generated for every single database that you built. Um, and as the, as the kind of the progress vision or the product vision has progressed, and we built more. Um, now, a lot of that is coming into the product, you know, and we have, uh, apps blocks on top of Airtable to again that that some of them are are also horizontal like charts or visualization tools but some of them are starting to be very use case specific you know um, like we have a clear bit integration that's like tailor made for CRM use cases and, and and things like that so I think you know the stepping back I think like the way that we tried to 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 deal with the the risk inherent in going horizontal was by having a plan to having like a product plan to also be able to go deeply vertical, uh, you know, as well without suffering from extreme feature bloat, you know, where you're trying to shove so many features into the core product that it be, kind of becomes unusable and the, the horizontal vision of the product doesn't work anymore. Um, we, we kind of, the, the goal was to add the, these uh, vertical features in like this other ecosystem on top of Airtable so we could kind of have both. Um, so that, 
that's been, that I think this is one of the incredible parts of the product vision of the company is you know, that product vision goes way back to 2014 when they were, you know, when Howie and Emmett and Andrew were like, a, like building V1 and some of the other early engineers, you know, this team of like six, seven people were building V1, that vision has stayed remarkably consistent. And, and that's how they were thinking about we can achieve the horizontal and the vertical at the same time. Because I'll, I'll be honest, like back then, everybody was saying, just go vertical, right? Like that's the, it's the, it feels like the obvious choice. Um, and you were seeing other like massive vertical uh, software successes at that time too, or that were being developed at that time. So they were definitely getting a lot of pressure to just like stop at this horizontal game, just go vertical. Right. I mean, I think I would, I wonder if you would agree with the statement that Airtable is as valuable as it is because it's horizontal, but it's as widely adopted as it is because it's vertical capable. In other words, it, it was vertically, yeah, yeah. it was vertically oriented, but it was never perceived by anyone that I know at least to, to be a vertical tool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that look in some ways the early go to market was basically how do we, how do you go to market vertically with a horizontal product? because it's really hard to go to market with a purely horizontal product. So finding all of those use cases and building little go-to-market strategies for each of them, that was our way of kind of, um, kind of having both at the same time, you know, continuing to build the horizontal vision while g getting growth out of vertical specific use cases. Cool. Um, so we want to bring in our first audience uh, questioner, uh, cool. Nimrod Priel. So, uh, Nimrod is a CEO of a company called Radical in London. He's, uh, I'm a half hey. Israeli living in London. Nimrod's a full Israeli living in London. Um, <laughs> and, and Nimrod actually just raised his seed round. So congr 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 oh, congrats, Nimrod. Nimrod. Thank you. Um, thanks, David. This was very thought provoking. These are great frameworks. Um, I was wondering about the question of, of pricing. So like, how did you guys come up with the pricing? What do you think the pricing, how do you price well, essentially for bottoms up growth? And, and specifically, like, you know, do you, do you have to have it be very close to free or, or free? Like, do you have to like leave money on the table compared to like a top down approach? That kind of yeah, good question. Um, so I I wasn't around for the for the pricing at Airtable, um, and I would also say that there's no there's no like our approach isn't like necessarily the right approach either. Like the the way that but we've been thinking we've been talking a lot about pricing, and I think kind of where we've landed in terms of how to at least one of the ways to think about it is you know what are the think about what what you want your early your like early adopter users to achieve to kind of kick off some sort of expansion um so for for us like for, with bottoms up growth the kind of the key factor is that users start inviting other users like we need the individual use case to turn into a team use case you know we, we need to see that expansion um, so the, the kind of key factor there then is how can we design a pricing mechanism that does it, that, that greases the wheels towards that end game and doesn't, it doesn't throw up any barriers. Um, so I'm not sure if we necessarily did a particularly great job of that early on. Um, but, uh, you know, we're experimenting a lot with pricing now. I think like, as I kind of said in the presentation, I feel like we'll probably be experimenting with pricing for the next like 10 years. Too. I think it'll be kind of a consistent, uh, it, it'll be something we do all the time because I, I don't think it's ever kind of a solved problem. But the way that, the way that I would think about it and, and the way I would talk about it if I went back in time, you know, a few years too, is how do we design pricing to make it as easy as possible for that first user to invite the next user? Because we know that that was so critical for us is to turn, uh, is to turn Airtable from that individual use case into a team use case. Um, so for us, that looked like freemium. I think that you could make the argument that maybe it would have been better to do, um, to say it's free for teams up to five users and then we start charging, right? Like that, that, that might have made more sense. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, but I, I think there's a, depending on what that key moment is for, for you and your company, maybe it makes more sense to charge from day one, um, or to have a long free trial, um, 30 day free trial, but then force the upgrade at the end. 
You know, and there, there are companies that are doing bottoms up growth that are extremely successful doing that. You know, Front, uh, the email app, right? Long free trial, got to upgrade at the end. Um, and, and they're blowing it out of the water. So I, I don't think there's one, you know, one potential approach that, or one approach that, that for sure works for bottoms up growth. It has to do with what, what matches with your, um, your products kind of activation and viral uh, growth loop. Awesome. Thank you. So we're now going to be joined by Xenia, and she's the CEO of Planable, which is based in um, Bucharest. She also happens to be one of our portfolio company founders. Hey, David. Um, nice, hey, Xenia. To, nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, good to, good to hear from you again. Um, yeah. That was a really, really great uh, presentation. Uh, really good ideas. I particularly love the system that you built with uh, Intercom and Zapier and, and Slack. That's oh, yeah. Idea, and I already have a bunch of other ideas how to use it for ourselves. Cool. But I want to go back to that use case discovery. And I have a, a, a few specific questions around that. I'm curious if you were giving any type of incentives to users back then to talk to you guys, um, you know, and also what was the follow up afterwards with those users? Were you going back to them in terms of, uh, you know, if they were asking for something specific, if they had a specific request in terms of their use case, if you were building it up, did you have a yeah. system to track all of those users and go back to them and follow up based on what you discussed with them? Yeah, good questions. Um, okay, so incentives, it, de it depended. Uh, early on, we didn't offer, at the, early on, we didn't offer any incentives. Um, the, early on, the goal was basically as quickly as possible after somebody signed up, we would offer our free help. And, um, and we didn't offer incentives to, to let us help you. You know, we kind of hoped that the help was was good, was good good enough. Yeah. Um, so I think we we ended up offering incentives sometimes when we so early on we were only focusing on net like new users that were signing up. Later on, we started targeting existing users within specific industries uh, or with specific titles or functional roles. You know, because we wanted to like investigate construction. Or something. So we're, we're we spent you know two week sprint. Let's just talk to as many people in construction as we can. Then we would you know create a list in Intercom based on that the clear bit roles, right? Um, and then we might offer an incentive because they were existing user and it was a a somewhat random request, right? Whereas you know since we were kind of like uh, outbounding to them, um, so then we we would offer some incentive. Um, and then your second question was on like, what's the, what was the structure of the engagement? Um, so the, that's a great question. The, the way that we thought about it, especially for the users who were onboarding, uh, so who were brand new users. So we've really thought about it in terms of just how do we make this user most successful? So we tried to not limit ourselves to only one touch or you know just a call and then and then a um, and then an email and then a you know a check in a week later you know we tried to not limit ourselves and instead we tried to like let let the user kind of guide the the process a little bit so that we could and the goal really was we we wanted to learn what made the experience successful you know as as well so. Um, we, this was us trying to be, you know, anthropologists, you know, as much <laughs> as we could. Uh, I think that, look, that can go wrong, right? Like users can take advantage of you and just go, you know, you could end up um, just kind of being a support person for somebody for months. So there's limits to all of this. You want to be thoughtful about it. Uh, but we really tried to be, um, to let our guiding principle be, you know, how do we just make this user most successful? And then once that, once that's achieved, then we can look back and see what we've learned from it. And we, we kept track of all of it, you know, in an Airtable base. So every, you know, like that Zap updated, added a record in Airtable with that user's name and email. Um, and then, you know, whenever we, we if, if they responded to our email and wanted to set up a call, we would just keep track of all of those notes in that Airtable base. And over time, we added a lot of additional fields too, as, as new pieces of metadata kind of came up from conversations and started to become more important. You know, so maybe it started with just industry and role, but over time we started adding, you know, um, 
a bunch of other different factors that we determined to be useful you know, um, some obvious ones like companies, you know, like employee count and things like that, but also a lot of unique things specific to, you know, their usage of Airtable in particular, you know, like, are they using it in for this type of workflow or that type of workflow, you know, what is the schema design, like all of this very specific boring Airtable stuff that we started thinking a lot about. Gotcha. That's, that's very helpful. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, of course. Cool. So uh, next question is from Timer Abdal, uh, who is a London-based founder. Uh, the company is called Causal App. Um, it's also in this kind of next generation of, of uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, they're 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 building a um, a tool for Excel modeling or Excel style modeling, uh, sharing uh, it, 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 you know sharing scenarios. Uh, Timer, are you on? Yeah. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, Timer. Awesome. Hey, David, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, yeah, really super interesting stuff. And yeah, it's all exactly the kind of stuff we're thinking about for calls right now. Um, awesome. My question was around the sort of identifying use cases and using them to go to market. Could you, do you have any, could you give like a concrete example of like one of the early uh, go to market use cases and like specifically how you guys uh, tried to sort of grow within that? Like we've been buying ads, was it like content yeah. marketing? I'd love to hear a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I didn't get into too many specifics, um, but happy to, yeah, happy to uh, add a little bit of nuance now. Um, so like there were kind of some classic early ones that we kind of happened upon um, and they both, but I'll say the one, the one theme or the one consistent theme across all of them is we didn't come up with them. Like almost to a use case, it was a user who started using Airtable to do this thing and we heard about it because we did an onboarding session with them or they reached out to support or whatever. We heard about it, realized that Airtable was actually really good for this. And then that kicked off the process of like, oh, let's go find more people who are using Airtable for this. Like, can we validate this further and, and so on. Um, so some, um, some early examples are things like, um, you know, a lot of like product related use cases, product road mapping, product management. Um, a lot of user research, so kind of adjacent to product market, like user research use cases um, and uh, some content related use cases too. So like content marketing management, content calendar, uh, things like that as well. Basically, I mean, if you just go look at our, like, if you look at our templates and you look at like the featured templates, you know, those early ones, those were kind of like the, some of the early use cases that were really resonating with folks um, uh, back in the day. And the way that we thought about go to market was, you know, for, for each of these use cases, we would think about who are these people, you know, who, who are using Airtable as a product roadmap, let's say, and, you know, where do they hang out online? How can we find them? So we really tried to, instead of thinking of ourselves as being Airtable employees, you know, we were thinking of ourselves as being, um, I don't know, a product roadmap like Jira employees or, or um, you know, what is that other one? Uh, Prod plan or road monk. I think that might be one too. Um, you know, we would think like, what if we had a product that was a product roadmap? How would we go to market, you know? And would content marketing be a big piece of it or not? Would paid search, would Facebook ads, you know, let's, let's go down the line of all of the different potential uh, leverage points that we have uh, potential tactics that we have and let's let's think about does it make sense for this particular uh, group of people that we're trying to target and then let's experiment across all of them so that's what we did for all of these different use cases we just kind of thought about what's the menu of tactics that we have and let's experiment across all of them oh, that's really helpful thanks a lot yeah now we're going to be joined by Arne, who does business development at Quilable, um, which is based in Berlin. They're a startup which allows anyone to use AI for automation. So Arne, you may now ask your question to David. Hey, David. Good to see you again. Uh, hey, Arne. Yeah, good to see you. Um, so I wanted to get back to the sign-up process again. Uh, you, you already answered uh, some some questions on that, uh, but but I, I find this really interesting. And actually, we're building basically the same thing. Um, oh, nice. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is uh, whether you are using like any additional CRM system at the moment, or if it is purely based on Airtable and Intercom still. 
Yeah, so, um, well, right now we aren't doing this process anymore. You know, I would say this, this whole like use case identification, go to market whole thing um, made a ton of sense a few years ago and we've kind of evolved past it a little bit now. Um, so we aren't using it anymore at the time though it was all it was all the exa exactly those tools um so you know now we have now we use salesforce as our crm but we're doing entirely different and different different stuff with it um if we were to you know if i were to spin up this type of, of um, process again i would use exactly the same tools okay and uh, in related questions to that um we we also experimented with um uh, clear bit uh, and we we were thinking about personalizing this whole um, interaction with uh, users and, and kind of automating this but then we stepped away because we just figured some of the information was just rubbish um, I, I yeah. guess you're still using clear bit in order to enrich uh, your leads in Salesforce um, yeah. is that something like and, and I'm guessing that sometimes when for instance they're using Gmail uh, for the sign up you also don't get the most current position in um, is that just something that you sacrifice in order to get like, I don't know, 90, 95% right? Or is there, are, are you still kind of watching this consciously and, and doing double checks of some sort? Yeah, so it, it's a good question. We ended up, um, you know, I think we ended up limiting it actually to only uh, like non-free domains. So we only, we would only do calls like in this whole onboarding, you know, high touch onboarding approach with uh, users who had company domains. Um, and Clearbit's data for company domains is, is pretty, pretty good. So that is kind of how we got around the challenge. Cause I definitely agree that Clearbit data um, for, for Gmail or, you know, uh, you know, other free domains just isn't, isn't as good. It's hard to, hard to trust. So yeah, we just focused on company domains only. Awesome. Uh, uh, next question, I guess last question because we're coming up on your hard stop is from Thank you. Uh, Raphael Goldstein, uh, CEO of WeWeb in Paris. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, David. Uh, thank you hey. so much for your, for your talk. Super interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about this system as well because you know, like, I find it very interesting. We are pretty early. And, you know, still kind of iterating to find uh, the product market fit, basically. And I think it's a, it's a pretty good system to, to get to it. So my question was, based on what criteria did you qualify who is an interesting user? And how did you make this evolve, uh, like based on, on which KPIs, basically? Yeah, so, um, so early on, it was, it was pretty light, uh, lightweight. I, you know, I think early on, the the main targeting was company domain and it might've been greater than a hundred users or greater than 250 uh, or uh, by not users, uh, employee count at the company. Yeah. Um, I think that might've been it to start. Uh, and then um, over time we started focusing more on specific, uh, specific industries, uh, you know, so then we, you know, it evolved where it wasn't one stream of users coming in from intercom. We had like different segments based on industry classifications. So it got a little bit more complicated because, you know, one person on the team was focused on, you know, understanding people who worked in construction, like I said before, you know, and they were, and a few other industries and they were really focused on those. Um, and uh, then your other question was uh, around like, KPIs for how how this kind of how it's evolved yeah, yeah how how it evolved over time um, so with that we focused um, well there was there were a few things one is we did some like NPS um, type surveys with users and tried to map some sort of this is this is actually there is a I was saying that superhuman's approach doesn't always make sense but there's a the the article um, in I think it's in the first round review about their like product market fit approach yeah. is, is pretty interesting. And we ended up doing something somewhat similar. Um, and Superhuman actually used Airtable for part of that. So there's a, there's a template. Awesome. You can search for product market fit, I think, in the templates gallery. And there's a template that kind of 
uh, that you can build off of, or or just use for inspiration. Uh, <laughs> uh, thinking about Gil and my uh, previous conversation, but so there, there's a, a version of that which is like quasi NPS, which we we would do with users uh, to try to understand if like these were really did, were they really like active? Do they you know do they um, do they need Airtable or could yeah. they just use some alternative? Um, and then we we kind of uh, combine that with that framework for thinking about a use case is like desirability. Like, is this a good use case for Airtable overall? Um, Makes sense. Even, okay. you know, um, so is it good for like, do they like it? And do we want, do we want to spend resources to go after it? Uh, whether, you know, if they do. Okay. Awesome. Really clear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. David, thank you so much. Uh, we're just about at the hard stop. So yeah. I'll let you go without any further ado. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks all the, absolutely. All the, uh, 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 thank, thanks everyone who joined, joined the call and asked questions and I uh, look forward to seeing some of you next week on our next session. Thanks a lot, David. Cool. Thanks everybody. Thanks. See ya.